Got me. All right. Good. Mo- good. Good morning. Wow. <clears throat> it's just as well. It's actually twice as often because I do two services on a Sunday morning, so I'm more likely to say good morning up here than good evening or good a- good afternoon or whatever. How you doing? What's up? You know, greetings, salutations. Uh, anyways, we're here. I'm glad you guys are here. We're gonna cover the rest of the Passover and and some of the. Uh, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which they go together tonight. Um, but I have uh, one or two announcements to take care of, and then we'll, we'll worship. And then I'm trying to leave room because Passover and communion are very tied together. And we, you know, I know we already took communion um, on Good Friday together, but it's an opportunity for us to take it again. And I want to start taking it more often. It's just going to take a little bit more organization on my part to be able to do that. If you're hoping for organization and, and me to go together, I don't know if we've actually met each other yet. Um, anyways, I'm just kidding. 
Uh, the men's donuts is this week. Uh, so Saturday at 8 a.m. is when uh, the men are going to gather together and we'll have donuts. And I'm hoping to be there. My son has surgery again this, this week, so I'll be praying for him. But I'm, my plan is to be there. Um, so uh, his surgery is tomorrow. We should be able to, I should be able to be back Saturday um, for that. So if I'm not, don't worry, I'll arrange for somebody else to be here. But my plan is to be here 8, 8 a.m. Um, Saturday morning. Uh, I didn't announce it on Sunday, although I was trying to minimize those kind of, I probably should have announced it on Easter, but I was kind of focused on like, you know, the biggest day in the Christian calendar. Um, even bigger than Christmas is the day that Jesus raised from the dead. So um, so there's that, men's donuts. And also we will be doing a baptism soon. Um, so that'll be, that'll be good. I'd like to it, I'd like to get inquiries from a few other people to see if, if I'd rather get wet once than like five. I mean, I'll, I'll do it five times in five diff- different times, but, but I think that one of the important things in doing a baptism is to have the church family there. You know, there's an initiation into the family kind of a thing. Now, that's not my words. That's what several of the commentaries I've read call it this initi- initiation thing. Um, and it's just that we all belong to the same Savior. We, we all belong to Jesus together. So I don't have a, a day or time for that, but I, it was requested um, after uh, Easter Sunday. So um, just letting you know it's coming up, and I will announce it. I want to do it as soon as possible, but um, I'll try and give us enough time to respond. So if you know anybody that wants to be baptized, or if you yourself would like to be baptized, uh, let me know, and we'll, we'll make plans for that. Um, let's see here. The since it is the first of the month again, remember the second Tuesday of the month, you guys, the, the ladies have started their new, right? You finished the last one. I've, I've seen the new ones. I just didn't know if you started them or you will be starting them. Okay. So you have your new study starting this Tuesday. So if you haven't ever gone, this is a great time to start going. Uh, second Tuesday of the month, 630. Is that correct? Uh, 630 at the Shinbeck's house and you're going through Esther, I believe. Okay. Um, I have seen the books. I've seen some of you guys carrying them around and, and, and stuff, so it looks cool. Um, anyway, that's all the announcements I want to do, so that's all the announcements we are going to do. But again, I'm trying to leave room for communion at the end, so uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll worship the Lord together. Father, thank you so much for the gift of worship. Thank you for, Lord, allowing us uh, to be in this place, Lord, to, to have the weather... Um, to be shielded from the weather, um, Lord, to, to be able to have a place that's big enough to hold um, our church family. Um, Lord, we pray that you would receive all the glory and honor and praise tonight. May we lift our hearts to you. And uh, I pray, God, also that you be with us as we look into your word. Uh, thank you for giving us a reason to be here. Thank you for the gift of life itself. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand. We'll worship the Lord. I will stand in your house, O Lord. I will sing of your great love. For I was lost, but now I'm found under the mercy of the cross. Lift up my hands in sweet surrender. I lift up my voice to worship you. I give you my life. Fill me completely. Let your name.
I will sing of your great love. For I was lost, but now I'm found under the mercy of the cross. I lift up my hands in sweet surrender. I lift up my voice to worship you. I give you my life. Fill me completely, let your name be always on my lips. Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous My Savior's love for me, for me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine, he had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end. My Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see. It will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever
this next song, um, you guys have probably heard it going through, but we haven't actually sang it here yet. So um, it, it's playing sometimes when you guys are fellowshipping and stuff, but um, I wanted to try it tonight. We'll see. I haven't done it in front of everybody before, so this will be new for all of us. Though I walk through the valley and I can't see the way when the shadows surround me I will not be afraid for I know that you're with me, you will always provide. Though the path may be lonely, you will stay by my side. I will rest my soul while trusting you alone. Shepherd leads me, leads me, and he is all I need. In the darkest valley, I know, I know my shepherd. First verse again, since it's a new song for us. Though I walk through the valley and I can't see the way, when the shadows surround me, I will not be afraid. For I know that you're with me. You will always provide though the path may be lonely you will stay by my side I will rest my soul I'll trust in you alone for the Lord my shepherd darkest valley I know I know my shepherd is all I need let's do verse 2 Lord I know that you seek me when I'm trying to hide and your love it pursues me all the days of my life I will rest I will rest my soul I'll trust in you alone for the Lord my shepherd
it's due yet, not I, but through Christ in me. I'll change the order up a little bit. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on. In weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. This I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Lord God, we know that it's you who fills us. We know that it's you who gives us the ability to live this life that you've called us to live, to walk by faith and not by sight. God, I pray that you'd be with us as we look into your word. Be our teacher tonight. Um, strengthen us and encourage us, exhort us, point us to Jesus. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. We'll be back in Exodus 12. Well, it's April, and it's no longer March. So I hope you have your March verses memorized because those are in the past. Not, not really. We're memorizing them so that you'll continually use them. But we have a new verse, all right? So 
Um, I almost went with, my grandma suggested a verse, and I think we're going to end up using it soon enough. It's out of the Psalms. But today, this month, we're beginning um, our new verse. It's really simple, but I think it's a really important one. <laughs> I think it's an important reminder for each one of us. And, and it may seem maybe even an odd one to pull out as part of your armor to have as your sword, but I think we need to be reminded that we're supposed to be loving each other. So that's, it's not a, not a bad verse to have in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind um, as you're, you're seeking to walk out your relationship with Jesus. So anyhow, uh, it's 1 John 4.11, and it's super simple, and I think we can do it. And now 1 John has an entire, I was just talking to Pastor James actually yesterday, and we were talking about 1 John a little bit, and 1 John is definitely a book that you need to study in context very much. And there's a lot of people that have some kind of bizarre conclusions to the book of 1 John. Um, some people can turn it into a works-based salvation thing. There's all kinds of stuff that can happen. Um, but this is a very great reminder. Um, 1 John 4.11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 1 John 4.11. And now, obviously, in context, he's, he's described how God has loved us. And we know, in fact, on Sunday, we're going to get into Romans 5, 8, because we're in the middle of Romans 5, right? And Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, he's just got done talking about that in 1 John, in 1 John chapter 4, describing that Christ had died for us, and, and describing that as being a demonstration of God's love, although he doesn't use that wording. And so, um, right here we have, beloved, if God so loved us, and if you look at the previous verses, you can say, and he did, <laughs> and he does, uh, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another, 1 John 4.11. And so, that's our verse for the month. We went from our longest one to one of our shorter ones, but I think we can do this. So, this will be a great one for the month of April. You guys ready to say it together? All right. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 1 John 4, 11. All right. Coolness. Um, so you guys who were here on Wednesdays, have a, you have a head start on the people who will be learning this on Sunday morning. So with that being said, we'll be in Exodus chapter 12. We finished in the middle of Exodus 12 last time, so we're going to pick it up where we left off. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your mercy in our lives. Thank you for the truth of your word. I pray, God, that you would teach us as we look into your word. You would strengthen us as we look to your word. Lord, this is the, the manna we need. Ultimately, the bread come down from heaven, as we know from John chapter 6, is Jesus. And so I pray that you'd help us to see Jesus in this text as we look um, to the things you did in redeeming Israel um, and how much more that points to Jesus and how you have redeemed us through him. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Just wave at the people that are honking. Smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. Sorry, that's Madagascar. Um, anyways, so, that's really neat. I mean, they're just excited about Jesus. They must have saw a bumper sticker that says, honk if you love Jesus, so we can praise God about that. All right. Uh, Exodus chapter 12. We're going to pick it up in verse 14. That's where we left off. And remember, we were in the middle of the Passover being instituted, so this is when um, God has led up through these 10 strikes or these 10 plagues. This is the 10th one, uh, the death of the firstborn in Egypt is the tenth of the strikes that God does against Egypt and the false gods of Egypt and all of these things. And this is finally we're going to see tonight Israel set free from bondage in Egypt. And there's some really important things that we look at as we look um, at what Christ has done for us. But don't forget, we can't look beyond and see only the picture. We have to know that this is historical, that e that. Israel was actually really and truly delivered from Egypt. And this is the, the account of that. So anyways, we're in the middle of that Passover where uh, the, lamb had, the blood of the lamb had to be applied to the door so that the angel of death would pass over uh, the houses and the firstborn 
of, of each family would be spared. And that's what's been described. We went through a ton of those things and how, how those remind us and speak of, they, they foreshadow uh, Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist said when he pointed to Jesus Christ, which um, to our ears, if you've never been in church, that would sound really weird, calling a man a lamb. But to a Jewish mind, that, this would be the first thing they would think of, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They would think of the sacrifice. And ultimately, what we see is the blood of the Lamb that was applied to the door. Um, that Lamb died so that the firstborn didn't have to. It was a death that was substitutionary in, um, in nature. So anyhow, that's where we're at. Um, we're in the middle of that, so if, if you need to get caught up, we didn't have Bible study last Wednesday, but two Wednesdays ago, that should be on our, our app, it should be on our YouTube page, I think it, that, that, that particular week actually worked and loaded, so, um, but we, we ended uh, there at the end, and, or at the end of uh, verse 13, and 14 kind of connects the dots between where we ended with 13 and this beginning of 14. In fact, some of your Bibles may actually include 14 in the previous chapter, or previous, sorry, paragraph. Um, it says in verse 14, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. So now you see that Memorial Day is, is in the Bible. There it is. Only that's not exactly the same Memorial Day, obviously. Um, I can't help but think of, and this is the first thing I thought of, and I was like, you know, we've got the stuff ready for communion. We should just do communion tonight. Because what did Jesus tell his disciples when he was instituting essentially this meal that's being described? And he said, this is about the new covenant now not the old covenant. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. It's the, same, it's the same wording. That that remembrance were to have is the memorial that they were to have. That essentially what's being instituted by the Lord through Moses to the children of Israel is they needed to have a reminder of the great deliverance, the great um, salvation that God had provided um, out of their slavery out of their, the bondage that they had, you know, all of the different things. We talked about a lot of those last week. But they needed to be reminded. And that's what really communion is for us. It's, is, it's a way for us to remember because God knew the Israelites would forget pretty easily. God does ama- How often has God done an amazing thing in one of our lives and then we, we forget about it unless we write it down? Or we, we just have, you know, we've forgotten the the. Th- the acts of love, even on an individual level, he's done for us. How much more each one of us need to be reminded of the greatest act of love. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends, right? And, and so this, this great act of love that Jesus did for us, we remember by taking communion. And this, in Exodus 12, is foreshadowing that communion that Jesus would, would do. So this is a memorial for them. So that's He's saying this is a forever institution. They would always have to celebrate Passover. Now, <clears throat> I know I can't perfectly do this because I don't even perfectly understand it, but some of you guys are going to ask the question because Jesus was uh, crucified at the time of the Passover, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, all of those things. It was that time, and that's why we just did Easter last week, but you'll also look at your calendar and be like, wait a minute, it says Passover is in April. Well, that's because there was a great debate that happened a few hundred years after Jesus, and the church was trying to determine, as a church, what day do we actually celebrate? Do we celebrate that it has to be on this day or this day? Is it the Sunday that's the important day? Is it the Passover that's the important day? So there was a great debate. The Eastern Orthodox Church chose to do one thing. Several churches, they all made these different decisions. That's all I'm going to say about it, and that's why we just had Easter instead of having it in a, in a couple weeks, right? Because the, the main churches of the West chose whatever the criteria was that this was going to be. It has to do with the moons and the new moon, right? Because they had a lunar calendar, the Jewish people did. That's what it has to do with. I'm not sure I completely understand it. I know it was a giant controversy in the early church, 
and it was something that it, they tried to resolve, and it came up, and they fought over it again, and then it came up, and they, you know, so that's why sometimes it lands perfectly on Passover, and other times it doesn't quite. So that's, is that fair enough? I'm not going to be an expert in that, because I honestly, I don't care that much. I, I, rep, I, I celebrate the fact that Jesus raised, hopefully, every day of my life. It doesn't, I pick whatever day you want. I don't, Jesus is alive. You know, he is alive. Present tense, is alive. So, wow, I got a whole verse in. This is great. Um, okay. Um, this is a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Verse 15 says, Seven days shall you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove uh, the leaven, remove leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. We'll stop there for a second because he's about to tell, tell them what days to do it on for them. Okay. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is connected to Passover. So there's times in the New Testament, like in the Gospel of Luke, where you'll read about Passover, but he calls it the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's technically two different things that are brought together as one because they both deal with the initial coming out of, of Egypt. So that you can have Passover and you can have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. During uh, the New Testament times, it all fell under the same umbrella of being called the Feast of Unleavened Bread because the day of Passover kicked off the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Does that make sense? So... They're one and the same, but now we've already read about what was required for Passover. Now he's pointing to what's required for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They have to get the leaven out of their houses, right? That's the thing. And there's a reason for that. He's about to tell them why. Because leaven takes time to rise, right? I, I'm not a super baker guy, but um, I know my wife makes delicious breads, and sometimes they have leaven in them. I will point this out. Leaven was not a sin, though it is a picture of sin. The reason they had to be told to get it out was for a, a commemoration or a reminder as the memorial that they weren't able to use leaven because they were in such a hurry because when they left Egypt, they left swiftly, didn't have time for the bread to rise. The fact that they have to be told hey, it's that time of year again, get the leaven out and use this, he's going to tell them, use this to teach your kids. It wasn't sinful for them to have leaven except for on these particular feasts for, these, for certain, um, certain of the, the feasts that they were to hold. This is the, the first of the religious calendar, right? This is the new year. This is the birth of the nation. The first one in the religious calendar, there's going to be the Feast of Tabernacles and a few other ones like well, Pentecost is another one, but Pentecost, actually, there's leaven in the bread at Pentecost, which is interesting because Pentecost, as you guys know, especially like if you've heard the term Pentecostal, um, Pentecost was the, the feast that they were celebrating 50 days after Passover, where they were celebrating um, the harvest and, they were, and that's when the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 happened. But clear back in the Old Testament law in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, when it's describing how to celebrate these things, leaven was used in their bread in that one. And that happens to be when the Gentiles, when the, the, the church was born, as opposed to when the nation of Israel was born. And the, and the leaven, if you would, the, the Gentile nations were brought into the kingdom of God. Just... All the kind of an interesting thing. So leaven in and of itself is not sinful. It wasn't sinful for a Jewish person to, to eat things that were leavened, except for during these times. Okay? Because 
then later on in 1 Corinthians, Paul points to this, and Jesus also does in the book of Matthew, points to leaven as being a picture of sin, but it's not saying that leaven is in and of itself sinful. Okay, I, I think that that's an important, because some people get caught up in this and they, they get confused about it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to year by year at this time of year when they're celebrating it, re-get rid of the leaven. Otherwise, God would be like, hey, what are you doing with leaven in your house at all? You're not supposed to have it, right? That's, this is to commemorate the fact that they didn't have time to let the bread rise. They left with haste, and so therefore it was unleavened bread. Does that make sense? So the point of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to celebrate the, the rapid, um, all-at-once deliverance or all at once salvation that the children of Israel experienced when Pharaoh was like, get out of here, right? And we're going to read about that in a minute. So that, that I think, becomes pretty important. That's, that's what you, you need to know. Um, let's see here. The other, since it does picture, since it does picture for us, um, since it does picture for us sin, it is a reminder of us if Passover is when the Lamb of God was killed and, and then 2,000 years after that, Jesus himself was killed, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If leaven represents sin, then it talks about, it, it can remind us of that their new walk in their new birth was to be one that was, in a sense, without sin. They were to walk in newness of life. It's a reminder of that, too. All right, so um, let's see here. I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Verse 18 is where I left off last. He says, In the first month, from the 14th day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month, at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leaven, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he's a sojourner or native of the land, you shall eat nothing leaven in all your places. Um, you shall eat unleavened bread. So this is a part of that celebration. But Jesus, or excuse me, the Lord, is, is telling them how important it is that that's how they participate. He's, he's saying, look, this isn't optional. If you're going to be a member of the nation of Israel, you will participate. I don't believe what's being said in being cut off is talking about being stoned to death or something like that. It's saying you are no longer a part of the nation of Israel. You will be out you're, you're to, to leave Israel. That's, that's the important thing. Um, again, there's people who will debate that, that w would they die for it or would they not? I don't think they died for it. I think that they just separated themselves from the nation and said, God's essentially saying, look, if you're not going to participate in the deliverance that I've given you, then you're not going to participate at all. You're not, you're not going to be in the nation itself. Um, so we'll look at a little bit more. That's why I want to try and get to um, chapter 13 because that'll help us look at a few more things. Let's see here. Um, yeah, let me keep moving forward. So also, did you notice that the, the first day that they celebrated is to be a celebration together? And then seven days later, on the seventh day when they celebrate, it's supposed to be a celebration together, but they celebrate it by eating the, the, the unleavened bread. And it's a required celebration. It's one of the, the feasts where they had to attend uh, as um, when they get into the promised land, they have to attend that. Okay. Verse 21, then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For 
the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Okay, this is him reiterating some of the things that we went over, but he's now taking the instruction he received from the Lord, and now he's passing it on to these elders so that then the elders will in turn pass it on to them. It reminds me of what we talked about on Sunday, actually, about discipleship a little bit. And 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, where, where Paul is told, Paul, excuse me, Paul tells Timothy to take what I have taught you, pass it on to faithful men who will then pass it on to faithful men. That's the, the model of discipleship. Well, he gives it to these elders, the elders of Israel, and they then in turn help, that, help the rest of the children of Israel, which we'll find out potentially two million of them, um, celebrate this first Passover. So they have to select the lamb, they have to kill the lamb, and they have to apply the blood to the door. Um, the lintel, I triple checked this, the lintel is the head of the door. That's the top, the top part of the door. So you have the blood on the sides, the blood in the basin, and the blood on the top, which again, you connect the dots, it makes a cross. Um, so we see that, and Jesus being the door in John chapter 10, all of those things are very, very fitting. Um, what's interesting is, is they're to take hyssop, they're to take that plant, the hyssop plant, which I read was, mar- I don't know if I'm going to say this, this right, but I know I've seen it in the assorted spice rack. It is marjoram, mar- marjoram, mar- marjoram, something like that. Mar- See, nobody else knows how to say it either. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter at all what it is. What it's, I guess, but that's what it is. It's a white, flowery thing that you can use as a spice. I, I guess it has kind of a uh, minty flavor. Mar- marjoram? Majoram. Mat- anyways, okay. Uh, it's hyssop. It's hyssop. Um, so what's interesting about this is that this ends up being the plant that applies the blood here, and it ends up being an important plant um, in the book of Leviticus in chapters 14 and chapter 19, hyssop is used to apply the water in some ceremonial cleansings, and it's, a, it's used to apply the blood. And it's the water and the blood that get applied by the hyssop. I remember that when Jesus was pierced in his side in the book of John, that it was water and blood that came out. Um, and so it's this hyssop that's to be used. And what's amazing is, is in in David's psalm of repentance, when he repented for his sin with Bathsheba and for uh, arranging for the, the killing of her husband Uriah, um, he repented, and in verse 7 he says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. And David was knowing that there, there needed to be a, a full cleansing, there needed to be a sacrifice made, but there was no sacrifice for him. We've talked about that in the past, how he had committed sins that were worthy of death, but he was asking for God to apply that. And later on, then, we see that actually it was a a branch of hyssop where the sponge was offered to Jesus um, on the cross. So there's all of these connections to hyssop, and cleansing and blood go together with hyssop. It's the, it was basically the way I would so that I can move on and keep going. But the way I would think of hyssop as being, it's the application. Uh, hyssop is what would be used to apply the blood. So, so cleanse me with hyssop. Apply, apply it to me. You know, we need to apply it to ourselves. And they were called here to apply it to the door. The other reminder that I would give to us is as soon as it's applied, you're to stay put, right? You have to stay in the house. You apply it, you stay in the house. Now, when you're in the house, do you see the blood? No, you have to, by faith, go, hey, the blood was applied, and God is going to save me because the blood was applied. Whether you see it, whether you feel it, you know that it's been applied. And, and we know that we don't walk by, by sight, we don't walk by feel, we walk by faith. And when God told them to stay in the house, once the blood was applied, their job was to stay in the house. In in other words, they needed to be at rest in the house, not knowing what was happening outside. They needed to be at peace inside. They needed to be at rest. 
And just like we talked about in, in Romans chapter 5, our standing is in grace. We have peace with God because of the justification. Those things are still true. We're supposed to rest in the salvation that God has given us. Um, so they see it, and what's awesome is the blood was not for their benefit. Well, it was. It was for their benefit in their salvation, but it was the Lord who looked at the blood. Right? That's what it says. The Lord will not allow the destroyer to enter the house because the Lord will see the blood. And ultimately, the Lord looks at the blood of Jesus that's been applied to each one of our lives. When we have put our faith in him, it's him who sees it. And it's necessary because he's the one who has the power of life and death. He's the one who could destroy us. He's the one who we ought to fear, right? But he's the one who sees the blood, and he's the one who passes over. He's the one who doesn't look at our sin, but then he looks at Christ who became our sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become his righteousness. You know, so that we see that, that they're supposed to be content and stay in the house. Um, Okay. Also, it, there's nothing specific about who the destroyer is, but it does say in verse 23, uh, it's talking about that. It, the Lord appears to be that it's not the Lord himself that's the destroyer, but if we want to apply that to take that fast forward it all the way to re the book of Revelation, there is the destroyer who is the devil, and the Lord has the power Right? The Lord looks at the blood. The Lord doesn't allow the destroyer to come in when he sees the blood. So if we, if we think of it in that way, God's the one who has the power, the authority over the devil to say, no, you don't touch them. The blood's been applied. Right? And think about that for our, our own selves. That just like Job, Job was afflicted, but the Lord was there with him. The Lord, Though Job wasn't necessarily feeling it, uh, the Lord allowed certain things to happen uh, in the life of Job only as it passed through. Um, you know, Satan couldn't do anything that, that the Lord didn't allow him to do. And for us, we go through hard things, but know that when the Lord sees you, if you have put your faith in Jesus, he's looking at that applied blood. He's not going, you will not, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us death um, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? It's been taken away by the cross. So just a great reminder for us. Um, we aren't going to finish if I don't keep moving. Uh, let's see here. So, verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians when he sees the blood on the lintel of the two doorposts. The Lord will pass over the door and he will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. That's what we were just talking about. Verse 24, you shall observe this, at, this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. So they need to continue observing this. The Passover itself of the angel going was a one-time thing. The observation was to be a continuous thing. Does that make sense? Once a year they were to observe it, though there was only one time where they were the, the angel actually came and killed the firstborn in Egypt and, and all of that. I think it's obvious, but I probably need to say it. Okay. Um, verse 25. And when you come into the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, as he has promised, you shall... Sorry. When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? My eyes jumped up. You shall say... It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. This is awesome. So God is giving them instruction so that they will continue to pass these things on to the next generation. Right? They're to pass on what God has done in their lives, they're to pass on to the next generation. Specifically, they're to pass on the Passover so that they would know, so that the, the people who weren't there to experience the first Passover would be familiar with the fact that God delivered them in that Passover. And it's instruction for, for the older generation to teach the younger generation. We see that also in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, 
mind and strength. Right, and he, he goes on um, and tells them to, to pass it on. I may have butchered that one. Hold on. I don't trust myself when it comes to that sometimes. I know where it's at. So Deuteronomy 6, 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. See, I was right. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And there's more to it than that, but that the idea is that it's meant to be passed on and that's what God is instituting now. Well, how, they have to be able to understand so that they can pass on um, what they're experiencing now to their children. So it's important for us as adults to continue learning and to, to know what the word of God is so that we can pass the word of God, God on to the, to the next generation. It's critical. It, there, you know, we know that um, you're not born into the kingdom, you're born again into the kingdom. Born the first time, people, people who have only been born once need to be shown the gospel so that they can be born twice. It's been said, um, born once, die twice, born twice, die once. Um, it's, I don't know who came up with that saying. I remember driving, I was outside of Redmond, and I saw a lady had a bumper sticker on her car, and I couldn't figure it out, and then when I did, I was like, blow, I, I was like, I couldn't tell if I should be angry or sad or what. It just said born right the first time. And I was like, ah, I know what that means. No, you weren't. You're missing out on the grace of God. But it was, it, it took me a minute. I'm like, well, that's a weird thing to put on a bumper sticker. And anyways, the Bible says that we need to be born again. And our kids need to hear the gospel. It's that serious. It's that big of a deal. That God told the children of Israel to pass these things on to their children. And that's, that's the way that they're to be instituting it. So there's like an object lesson as they go through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as they go through the Passover, as they're observing it year after year after year, this object lesson showing them how God had delivered them. And in a sense, communion, when we take communion, it becomes an object lesson even to our kids. And that's why I, I actually think it's good for a parent to take their kid through communion so that they can understand that object lesson of Christ really dying for us and really taking his life in, into myself, in, into my being, so that my life is really coming from his life. Um, and there's more to it that we could talk about, but we got to keep moving. Um, oh, yeah, I, I can't pass this up. So um, he says in verse 27, just to recap, you shall say, this is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. That's awesome. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. You guys remember when we talked about worship on Sunday? When you look this up in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, same word, proskuneu. It's the idea of to kiss towards. It's it's There's a an adoration of God that they're, they're pouring out here. Um, and I love that, that their response to the Passover, their, their response to the promise of God delivering them was worship. And what's the next verse say? The next verse says, Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Worship and obedience. They go together, right? They go together. When we worship is a is a more than just songs. We worship the Lord through our actions. We worship by obeying. It's a way of a way of worship. Worshiping the Lord is to obey Him. Um, and so, if they hadn't done that, now imagine they we've gone. This is a long chapter, right? This is our second day into this chapter. It might end up being our fourth day pretty soon. Our second day in this chapter, it's a, long, it's a long chapter. They've gotten all of these ordinances of how Passover is supposed to work, but it was still up to them to decide, am I going to apply the blood or not? Am I going to do what God has told me to do or not? See, 
a lot of people will say, well, Jesus died. He died on the cross for all of our sins. And they'll leave it as a statement rather than something that they've applied to their lives. They have not put their faith in Jesus. They've just, they've just said something that they've heard repeated. It doesn't mean anything more than a sentence. And, and they had to physically apply that blood for the, the, the destroyer to pass over. We have to turn to Jesus and put our faith in him. And when we do that, the destroyer, the second death, will pass over us. We will not experience the second death. But if we just believe it as a sentence without application, then that's not faith. Right? That's the faith, faith is an act of trust in that God will do what he said he will do. They're, they're believing that, okay, we're killing this lamb, we're going to apply this blood, and God said, if we do those things, we will live. In the New Testament, the Bible says in, I'm going to go ahead and read it because I don't want to do it off the top of my head, although I might be able to. In, G, in Romans chapter 10, which we'll get to in about 2026 20, on Sunday mornings. In Romans chapter 10, we've read this before together. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Verse 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Right? We've talked about it. But it, it's, that's the application. That, to me, that's part of putting the blood on the doorpost, is confessing the Lord and, and repenting and turning to him in faith. Um, I keep, in my mind, I remember this song, this old hymn. I don't know how old it is, but this hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Um, it's a song that we sang when I was growing up in church. And and there's there's a there's a pretty strong level of truth to that, that we're called to obey him. It's not enough to just nod at him, right? Jesus told a parable, and I'm going off script a little bit, so Jesus told a parable about two sons who were called, asked by their father to go work in the field. Um, I believe this is in the Gospel of Luke, but I could be wrong. It's either Matthew or Luke. Um, anyways, this, this father who asked his two sons to go into the field and work. And the one son said, uh, no, I don't want to do it. But he felt bad later on and went ahead and did what his father had asked him to do. The, the second son said, sure, dad, I'll go. And he never went. And then Jesus asked the question, which of those sons, which of those sons did what the father asked? The one who just said it? or the one who actually went to the field and did it. And that's, that's ultimately what um, we're called to do. They needed to apply that blood. They needed to um, get up and do what God had told them to do. <laughs> okay. It says in verse 29, the moment you guys have all been waiting for, the 10th plague. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in, uh, in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. I gotta turn this. Um... Verse 31, then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, go, excuse me, up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. Um, so I gotta arrange my notes here for a second. Um, so this is where this is where the 10th plague or the 10th strike happens, right? Um, 
And it says there was not a house in all of Egypt that wasn't affected. And essentially what we have to know about this, there's not, there's not a person in all the world that won't be affected by death. Death is a reality because of sin that's in the world. And the way that the sting, and, the sting of death is taken away is through the cross. But Pharaoh is able to, um, or not able to, but Pharaoh finally experiences um, that breaking that he had been so stubbornly fighting against. He's a broken person because his son is dead. And I read one person suggesting this, that it wasn't just a quiet passing because this happened at midnight in the middle of the night where every house knew that someone had died, which means it wasn't, it was probably some kind of a violent death. It was some kind of a, a you know, painful screaming or something in order to wake everyone up for them to know that this, that the, this firstborn child has just died, however old they were, that it was some kind of something woke everyone up, and then there was a cry because the living cried over the dead. And in a sense, I have, have these couple written down, but here it says that there was a cry that went out throughout all the land of Egypt. But remember um, that in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, that God had said, I've heard the cry of my people. It's come up to my ears. He knew that they were in slavery. And the Egyptians ignored it. And in Exodus chapter 5, verse 15, when Pharaoh had afflicted, put more burden on them, didn't give them the straw that, he, you know, that they had had before, the cry went out over their burden, and the Egyptians ignored it. And now we see the, that the cry for them is going up. Um, they ignored the cry of, of the children of Israel, and they experienced their own um, reason to cry here because they had ignored, well, whether they knew or not, um, they had ignored the prescription. The only way you can avoid the, um, the destroyer coming into your life was through the blood of the lamb. And they, again, whether they knew it or not, they had not applied the blood and therefore they ended up experiencing this death. Um, we also see that, that um, Pharaoh, in this sense, experienced this death and this is the last of the... Of the, the um, Excuse me, i got to flip this. The last of the um, gods of Egypt. Um, I have it written down right there. Um, the last of the gods of Egypt. Number one would be Osiris, because they believed Osiris was the Egyptian god who gave life. But God used the destroyer to take that away, to show that he passed over um, because of the blood of the lamb in taking the firstborn from the children of Israel, but, he's, but Osiris was no match for God. And the other, the other deity that was struck down was Pharaoh himself, because he, he killed the firstborn. In, in other words, Pharaoh himself didn't die, but the next Pharaoh did, the firstborn son of Pharaoh. And it's believed that if Amenhotep II was the pharaoh of Egypt that is talking to Moses here, um, I guess they found some kind of an inscription in the Sphinx um, that refers to um, the son of Amenhotep II, Thutmose IV, who there's some kind of a, an inscription that, that is supposed to be giving the protection of the gods over Thutmose the fourth and somehow the way it's written again I am not I, I, I'm learning Greek right now not ever going to touch hieroglyphics in Egyptian so <laughs> not happening um, but somehow connected to that is is that it's it's believed that the way it's written that Thutmose the fourth is not the firstborn of Amenhotep the second that he, he is his son but he's not the firstborn and that they needed to pronounce this divine protection on him because the firstborn had been taken away. Um, and that's just, I mean, that's, I'll leave it up to potential archaeological proof. It's something I read. 
I'm not, you know, I'm not Indiana Jones. I can't, I didn't prove it. Um, but I think that that's really interesting. That, that that great cry because they had he had fight, he had touched the line of the deity of Egypt that Pharaoh if Pharaoh is God then God took the next God and um, Pharaoh ends up so broken that that remember how he was going to let Moses go but you've got to keep you got to keep your kids back you can go but you got to keep your stuff here you can go but not very far we've talked about that this time it's go. Everything that you ask for, just go. And look at how broken Pharaoh is, that he has to submit himself and admit himself that, and bless me also. Meaning he knows that he's not God anymore. Whether he ever actually thought it is totally, you know, I can't get into his heart to know that. But he, he finally with his own mouth says, I, I need God to bless me. I'm not saying Pharaoh got saved. That's not my point. My point is that it demonstrates the utter brokenness, that one of the things that God had done in in his work in delivering the children of Israel was to free God's people. Um, Another thing that he did was to punish Egypt for the slavery that they had inflicted upon Israel, right? Right? Another thing that he did was dismantle their idolatry to show him as being the only true God. And another thing he did was to display his own power. That went forward clear into the book of Joshua where Rahab was like, oh, it's the children of Israel. You guys are here. We're freaked out. We heard what happened in Egypt, right? Even the power of God, the the message of how powerfully God had delivered them from Egypt, the Canaanites knew all about it. The people of Jericho were fully aware that that the God that these Hebrews worshipped was mighty, that he was powerful, and that he he was more powerful than the gods of Egypt. And think about it, if if it's, we're going to read, it's it's 430 years from um, the time they went into Egypt during the time of Joseph, right? Until this this day when they're delivered out of Egypt, that's what the, the... Exodus tells us here in Exodus 12 that it's 430 years. If that's the case, it's not so far away for, remember, Egypt became this power because of Joseph where they had, they had crops when no one else did. They had food when no one else did. And some people may have attributed that to the gods of Egypt, wrongly. But what God does is he breaks that superstition he breaks that idea to show that he's the one who's powerful by delivering the children of Israel f- punishing them for the slavery dismantling the idolatry and demonstrating his power Th- that's huge what god is doing here so now they're finally this is this is it they're free at last right we've been waiting 12 long chapters to to see the children of Israel free and here they are freed Verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel um, had also done as Moses told them. For they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. In a sense, that's payment for all their slavery. Uh, Later on, uh, that gold and silver ends up being molded into a calf, but that's a different story. An idol, not good. But the the Lord had told them, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be delivered. You're going to be taken care of. And and, um, the, the... people of Egypt are going to give you their things when it, when it comes time for you to leave, right? And so the word of the Lord took place. But the other thing was, is even if um, one of the commentator, commentators I was reading, whether the children of Israel listened about the leaven or not, they didn't have a choice. The bread didn't have time to rise, right? That's what it's saying. The, the dough and the kneading bowls, they just had to pick it up and go. There was no time for it. Now I'm thinking that they did what they were told. They did everything else they were told. There was no 
leaven in the dough. But God didn't do it because leaven is evil in and of itself. He did it because he was demonstrating when you go, it's going to be quick. When you go, you won't have time. And so now we see the fulfillment of that. That's what's being pointed to right here. Okay. Um, verse 37, And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, for they had, uh, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. So I'll pause there for a second. It says 600,000 men on foot. Now, if um, this matches the number that we see in, in the early parts of the book of Numbers, I believe it's Numbers chapter 1, um, if that makes up about a quarter of the population, because it's only the fighting aged men is who, who they're counting. The fighting aged men of the children of Israel, 600,000. Then there's about 2 million people that are leaving Egypt right now, roughly. Um, and there's people who doubt that and say, well, the, they could have never survived in the wilderness or in the desert with if there was that many people. So the numbers must be messed up, and they try and do all these calculations. I think you missed the point of the rest of the book because God miraculously provides for them, and that's kind of the point, yeah. right? So unless we, uh, you know, we can add all our own little personal conjecture and, and um, our subjective finite knowledge to trying to say that that's not how many people there really were because if we take this word and do that, like I am one of those people that would rather read it at face value and be like, this is what God said. Now if there's, you know, we, we'll look, the original manuscripts, I believe in the inerrancy of the word of God in, in the way that it was originally transmitted. Um, and so sometimes when you have manuscripts that differ, the original manuscript, when when the Holy Spirit inspired Jeremiah or Isaiah or Paul to write something down, that was full-on inspiration from God. It is inerrant. I'm not going to start trying to make the numbers make me feel good, especially when, well, I mean, I don't feel bad about them, so it, it doesn't matter. But, but there's people that have a hard time with these numbers, and I just would remind them that the supernatural God who said in the beginning, you know, let there be light, and there was light, he can take care of two million people in a desert. That's not really a problem. When he said there was manna, when he said there was quails, when he said there was water that came from a rock, that's what happened. There you go. <laughs> so that's the number, uh, roughly, is about two million. And... Um, and we see, again, more of the evidence of them leaving, not having time to have the bread rise. So that's how they, they left in haste. Um, verse 40. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord, by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. So 430 years to the day from the time they went into Egypt, they went out of Egypt. Um, God kept track of it. God said it. That works for me. <laughs> um, anyways, 430 years. On that very day, they take, they, God watched over them, so now they, they watch over the day, meaning they, they observe it. Um, verse 43, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired servant may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall, take, you shall not take of the flesh outside of the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If 
a stranger shall sh sojourn with you and would keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. Verse 50, all the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Okay, so we're not going to do 13, but I have some kind of important things to say here in 12, and then we'll take communion together. Um, first of all, he points to the fact that in order to participate, the males of whoever's participating, if they're not of the tribes of Israel, they can't unless they're circumcised. Meaning, what was circumcision was pointing to the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. So, you couldn't be a partaker in the blessing of, be, of deliverance, the blessing of um, salvation, unless you were also um, putting yourself under the covenant of salvation. And that, that's the reminder for us that Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant, the blood that's spilled for us. We, we can't, in other words, we don't get to have a, a partial salvation. We're not, we can't be half-hearted about it. Now, I'm not talking about, man, unless I'm feeling really intense at all times, I'm not saved. But I'm saying I'm all in when it comes to my faith in Jesus. He gave all of himself for me. I give all of myself to him. I trust in him. Now, again, I'm not talking about earning our salvation. It's by faith. By grace, through faith, are you saved. That not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Right? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But what I am talking about is that I think that that's a reminder that they were to be partakers of the covenant. They needed to give their lives to the covenant. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 says that we have the covenant, we have the circumcision of Christ, not the circumcision made with hands, but the circumcision made without hands. Meaning, our hearts have been made new. We have The hearts of stone have been taken out. We've been given a heart of flesh. In fact, Deuteronomy talks about not just having a circumcision on the outside, but have, having a circumcision of the heart. It's about having our hearts being given over to him. We participate in the new covenant, therefore we are partakers of the salvation that, that the Lamb of God gives us. All of those things are connected. So God's saying, hey, if those people who aren't of Israel want to, they want to celebrate the Passover with you, here's how they have to do it. They have to come under the covenant in order to do that. That makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and so we come under the new covenant and we experience the salvation. Now Jude warns us, I believe it's Jude verse 5, there's only one chapter in Jude, where he says, all of the children of Israel were brought out of the land, but not all believed and were later destroyed. So he's referring to being in the assembly is not enough. We need to have faith in the Lord. And, you know, Jude is warning about false teachers. Uh, that's kind of the point of his book. Um, he's calling us to contend for the faith. Another thing to remind us of is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, let me read this. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says that Christ is our Passover, but 1 Corinthians chapter 10 reminds us. Here we go. Right there. He says, For I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were under... Oh, this I got here a little bit earlier. Sorry. Well, I want to read this anyways. <laughs> For I, I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. We'll talk about that next week. And all passed through the sea, maybe in a couple of weeks. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and drank from the same spiritual drink. They, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, most of them, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. 
So all of these things that, that's happening to them in Egypt in their initial being delivered out is an example for us. And that's why I'm pointing to that being circumcised of heart. If we want to experience that salvation that Passover pointed to, then we also need to have our hearts given over to the Lord. I think that's fair, that's a fair connection to make, right? And so that's that's what I want us to be able to see. That's what um, I want us to be um, I guess warned about. Not to just come to church to sit down, but to have our hearts belong to Jesus. And it's a constant prayer of mine. Like, you know, I know that the world sometimes we we can get caught up in thinking that that they might know what they're talking about. They don't. And I mean the world system. <laughs> um we can we can look at 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 you know what Hebrews calls the fleeting pleasures of sin, Hebrews chapter 11, where Moses could have done that, but instead he, cho- he chose to suffer with the people of God. It's, we're called to have our hearts given over to him, and I would say that we're called, and this is just my, I guess my opinion, but I think it's backed up by the word, that we're constantly re-giving our hearts back to God, re-giving our hearts back to God. He, uh, Romans chapter 12 calls us to be a living sacrifice to him. And so I think this is a good, and, and we won't take forever, but I think it'd be really good for us. Having read through this Passover part, I wish we could have got to 13 because there's some really cool stuff in there too. But let's, let's take communion together. We won't spend forever, but it, it makes sense to connect the new covenant with this reminder from the old covenant. We're not going to ever do the old covenant because Christ has fulfilled that, but let's remind ourselves as a memorial what Christ has done for us, that we have eternal life because of him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the gift of the cross. God, I I pray that you'd be with us as we we look into um, the memorial that you instituted on the night that you were betrayed. Um, Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for this great tangible way of reminding us that Jesus, you really did die. You really did rise. And because of that, we really are saved. Anyone who's put their faith in you, God. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. So like we normally do, remember there's a, the bread is in the bottom cup, so remember there's two cups to pick up. Um, we'll, while we do this song, come, come and grab your communion and then we'll take it together. Let's do how deep the Father's love. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all men. That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turned his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory is
His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in it. Again, this is a memorial. This is a way for us to remember what Jesus has done. Um, and I love that even starting clear back in Exodus, God knew we'd, we would need reminders all the time. And Jesus was able to take this and do something greater than even a lamb dying with its blood being put on doorposts. And he was able to die on a cross publicly, no doubt about his death. And then rise. Um, when I was studying for, for Easter, I, re I remember reading one of the commentators put, after the spear had pierced his side, not a loving hand, not it, um, no one but those who loved him touched him. Because Joseph of Arimathea was the very next person to touch Jesus. And then the women fell at his feet and, and kissed his feet and worshipped him when he was risen that Thomas, who loved him, touched his hands, that he broke bread, he even cooked fish. He's alive, but he gave us this very tangible way for us to remember that he died and that, get this, he's not going to drink of this again until he does it with us. So this, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians, is also not just a reminder of the life he gave, but that he's coming back. It, it looks forward to his return as well. So we have this amazing way of remembering it. Um, what we're going to do, we'll just pray, um, and we'll, we'll take them together. So take your, the bread first and then the juice. Remember, the bread represents his body, which was broken for us. And in a sense, we're all partakers of the same body. It's a reminder that, you know, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, that we all belong to the same Savior, and that his blood was shed for us. The, the book of Leviticus says that life is in the blood, that it's his life for our life. Our life earned death. He paid for death to give us life. It's an amazing reminder. Lord, thank you so much for the gift of the cross. Thank you for loving us with such an everlasting love. Lord, and even as Romans 5 says, for demonstrating in, the, in this way. What a demonstration. Thank you for being so merciful. And if you've loved us, we ought also to love one another. Thank you for this gift. Thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Whenever you're ready. All right, one more song. You can keep praying if you want to keep praying.
he became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself carried the cross love so amazing love so Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Messiah, Lord of all, His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out, all for love, the whole earth trembled, the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed God, thank you for, thank you for you. Be with my brothers and sisters as we go from this place. May we glorify you in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great night.